If you've noticed the smoke behind me, you might be wondering where it's coming from. And it's because the brigandine I'm wearing is smoking hot. Or uh, there's an actual fire behind me, which is coming up in this video, okay? There's a reason why it's there. And uh, if you're a world builder of any kind, this video is gonna be interesting and helpful to you, but also this video's sponsor, which is World Anvil. Now, if you like creating worlds, whether that is for role-playing games, any number of role-playing games, Dungeons and Dragons, but also sci-fi based ones, anything, okay? But if you're a writer, if you're just a hobby writer or you're trying to break out, or if you're a game developer, if you make graphic novels, World Anvil is one of the very best tools for creating your world. It essentially enables you to make your very own wiki where everything is linked, okay? The backstories, the histories, the characters, it has interactive maps and timelines as well for your characters. Oh, and all these features are free, okay? So those are brilliant and it has a host of additional features if you want to subscribe. And if you subscribe, there is a new amazing, you know, release that has just been brought out that's in beta and it's constantly getting better. This is the manuscript updates which is available for master tier subscribers. Manuscripts is a writing software that is fully integrated into World Anvil and you can write your whole story there with it linked to all your reference files for your world and all the detail and history that you've made but it's not only just for writing you can actually make graphic novels on this thing you can also write short stories comic books campaign settings and it's all saved on the cloud so you're never gonna lose it which is kind of a nightmare for any writer actually losing your manuscript with a crut file or something like that. That's not gonna happen. Now, in addition to this, you actually have publishing options available where after everything is polished, you can give exclusive access to say, patrons or anything like that, and or you can actually export it into EPUB formats or even Word. And so it gives you a heap of flexibility because as I mentioned, it's fully integrated into World Anvil and you can even do comic books and graphic novels through this. So World Anvil already provides a massive amount of free features and it's just gotten even better if you want to be a master tier member. So a big thank you to World Anvil for sponsoring this video. I really do encourage you to go check them out. There is a link in the description below. Shadow <sighs> Greetings. I'm Shad. And in this video, I want to explore how the magic from Avatar The Last Airbender would work in real life. Now, of course, we can only take that so far because certain liberties must be taken. But having said that, these liberties usually are additions to physical conditions of the world. And if these additions, for instance, the very fact that you can manipulate certain elements, if you're consistent with them, they can feel like physical laws in this different universe. But when you're working with things that already exist, say the laws of physics or the elements themselves, well, we know quite solidly how they actually work and what their states are, thanks to modern day science. But this wasn't the case back in the day, because the idea of the natural world, when we try and look at it and break down what are the primary elements, that being earth, fire, wind, and water, well, this breakdown actually has very old origins in different philosophies. But this is the thing. Those aren't individual elements. Each one of those categories, earth, fire, wind, and water, are a combination of sometimes several different elements. And as a result, they're not a very good breakdown or summary of the natural world. And in actual fact, earth, fire, wind, and water seems to leave out some pretty important elements if you were looking at the natural world, like plant life. But plant life usually is thrown into earth but not always. So there are some holes with this categorization system, but as not to say it can't work. If uh, the audience can simply accept and go with it, yeah, that reflects the natural world, which I've done, many people have done. You can have a really effective magic system based on that categorization, as Avatar The Last Airbender has shown, and also other things like Wheel of Time and even Captain Planet, yes. But when trying to figure out how they would work in real life, if it could actually exist, well, we are more strictly restricted to physical laws and conditions, and they don't reflect 
or are accurate to what they are. But there is another type of categorization system that would work much better. Now, would a more accurate breakdown of the physical world improve a magic system? It depends. Magic by its very definition is unrealistic, but if you can make it operate consistently, you can make it feel very believable and even, dare I say, realistic. And that also includes trying to make it operate in a way that conforms to physical laws. And there's actually a very big difference between outwardly contradicting those physical laws or adding in new laws on top of the ones that already exist and even new sources of energy. Now, this is when you can actually actually have the liberties that need to be taken, like for instance, the very ability to manipulate an element, okay? What is causing that? Well, you can answer that by adding in a new kind of condition in this universe, magic, right? And then not have it contradict other physical laws. So it can work really realistically. And these are the liberties that we would need to take if we want to try and see how this magic would work in real life. For instance, the big addition that is used in bending specifically is that when you look at how bending works, it's not actually just elemental manipulation is not even elemental specific, okay? Because these categories aren't specific elements, they're actually broader categories, but it is a category specific type of telekinesis. In the TV show, Avatar The Last Airbender, we literally see bending levitate things, like when earth bending, they can levitate rocks and throw them. They are moving these uh, elements, I'm using that loosely now, around, through, I said, yes, telekinesis. Now, does telekinesis contradict physical laws? Not if it's a new type of energy that can actually, you know, be controlled by the mind and you can reach out and lift something, okay? If you're adding something new, that can work. And we're going to keep that, okay? But then, if we want it to conform accurately to the either conditions of the natural world or the elements, well, we shouldn't contradict what those laws and rules are. Now, the audience can accept earth, fire, wind, water as a broad kind of encompassing categorization of the elements of the physical world, even though they don't actually make sense. And that's fine, okay? But I personally feel if you go the extra mile and try and work it more accurately, it makes it more believable and immersive. And that's just looking at it in its own fantasy world. If this was actually brought into the real world, these are the limitations and problems that bending would run into according to what the elements actually are and the laws of physics. For instance, fire. Now, fire is one of the more popular elements in the classic breakdown of earth, fire, wind and water because it's powerful, usually depicted as being powerful, but fire, even in its you know, natural state in the real world, can also be very dangerous and harmful, okay? All the other elements you can touch with your hand in the classic breakdown system and you'll be fine. Touch fire, you'll burn yourself. But fire isn't a single element by itself. Essentially, it's a combination of two elements, that being oxygen and carbon, but that doesn't describe what it actually is either, because smoke is oxygen and carbon. So what's the difference? The difference is temperature. Fire is essentially very hot smoke, specifically oxygen and carbon in a incandescent state, which is a state that is so hot that it glows emanating light. Well, that is the flame portion of fire, and it's caused by a chain reaction of oxygen, fuel, and heat, okay? When those three things combine, and the heat is specifically hot enough, it will cause a chain reaction of the oxygen bonding to the carbon, which then creates more heat, hence the chain reaction. And the bonding of the, uh, you know, carbon to the oxygen <laughs> creates smoke and when that smoke is first released it's very very hot glowing red but as it rises up it cools down rapidly into red ass smoke <laughs> now the reason why fire never really made sense to me in this elemental breakdown of earth fire wind and water is that in reality fire is actually a, just another type of air air in this breakdown was never specifically categorized as being oxygen and air has a percentage of carbon dioxide in it that's where the smoke goes from fire 
And if the magic system can manipulate air, it can therefore manipulate carbon dioxide, which is exactly what fire is, just so hot that it's incandescent. Okay, so that was fire, essentially the combination of two elements, not a single one, in a very specific state, that state being heat. It's hot. Contrast that with water. Now, water's, you know, elemental makeup is more broadly known, H2O, the combination of hydrogen and oxygen, and you might actually see a bit of a theme running through earth, fire, wind and water, that oxygen is playing a very major role in nearly all of them. But contrasting to fire, water can't be too hot, because if it's too hot it'll actually turn into water vapour, a gaseous state, and if it's too cold it'll turn into a solid state, which is ice. Now having said that, water is hugely fundamental and necessary for all life on Earth, mostly anyway, and uh, I can really see why water would want to be considered one of the broad categories of the elemental world, but again, it's a, it's a combination of two elements. It's not a specific singular element, and so to call these the elements, it's, it's essentially wrong. The elements, there's actually quite a number of them, beginning with hydrogen, then helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluoride, neon, sodium, magnesium, and the list goes on, okay? The periodic table. Those are the elements, not these things, but you could find a better categorization system that broadly encompasses these different elements, which I'll mention a little later, but first we need to talk about earth and air. I present to you dirt, or earth, soil, essentially, and this is a, an interesting one when you consider what elements are actually comprised in it, because there's actually a lot. A lot of it is broken down plant matter, which is going to be carbon as a result. But the other common elements in it is oxygen, funnily enough, also calcium, silicon, aluminium, iron, and varying amounts of magnesium. Uh, now generally these will be in some types of molecules, for instance iron will be in varying, ty varying types of iron oxides, whether that's Oh, I can't remember. I'll bring them up there, okay? Different types of iron oxides that you can find naturally. Okay, and so this is where you're actually going to find a decent amount of the oxygen. It's bonded to a lot of other uh, elements as well. And so, like, out of all the elements, this is one of the most uh, odd ones to try and classify as a single element because it's got so many different elements in it. Which raises the question as to why earthbending can't bend plant life or metals. Dirt by itself has a huge amount of broken down plant matter in it and they're bending that and earth and rock in its natural state has a lot of trace metals in it. Where do metals come from in the first place? A lot of them come from rock formations in the ground but earthbenders can bend rock but they can't bend metal? It's just very odd. And I'm talking about directly bending metal, not bending the impurities in metal. You see, when sticking to these strict categories, when you actually look into what they are, these categories end up contradicting themselves. And finally we come to air. Now, as a kid in primary school, we were told that air is mostly oxygen, because that's what we breathe in. Well, no, actually, oxygen only accounts for maybe 20% of the air out. Most of it's nitrogen, 78% nitrogen. And then you have uh, argon, which is like, what, 1%, and carbon is like 0. Point something percent, 0.03%. And then the other, you know, gases in the atmosphere or elements kind of go down uh, from there. But the primary ones being nitrogen, then oxygen, then argon, then carbon, or carbon dioxide. So once again, air is not a single element, but it does reflect a state. And this is where I think the we're finding some of the more accurate classifications of the natural states. And that's not by classifying them according to elements, but according to the states of matter. And that makes far more sense. Now, it's funny, when I actually show what these are, you could then say, well, what is the most representative uh, substance on Earth that represents these states, and we're going to come back to the classic four, so maybe you can work the classic four if you're actually being more specific, because if you are being more specific, they wouldn't operate or work in the same way that they are depicted in Avatar The Last Airbender, but other, you know, fantasy magic systems that use them. So what are these states? Well, I think you might already know of them. It's solid, liquid, 
gas, and then temperature. Those are the primary states. Now, could you say plasma? Plasma is generally considered a fourth state of matter. Uh, yes, technically, maybe you could have that as a category of the magic system, but it's so rare that it's like they don't have magic as a result. But if you work off these primary ones, then, you're, then you've got something to work with. So instead of being able to manipulate Earth or fire specifically, because if you use those category systems, like I said, I really do feel there are some pretty prominent categories that are completely left out, like plant life, and that the fact it's incorporated into uh, Earth doesn't really make sense. But what's also interesting is Avatar, last year, but in Bending, they have a, uh, another element that's incorporated into fire, which is electricity. Now, electricity... That perhaps that one could be represent uh, plasma, okay? Um, but that is a very significant not state because electricity is essentially, well, it's in combination with one of the primary fundamental forces. So if you're being really, like, trying to be broad and encapsulate what is in our natural world, you probably want to include the fundamental forces as well, which is electromagnetism, the weak and strong nuclear forces, and then gravity, okay? And so if you were conforming to physical laws, these would be the categories, and I'll say them again. It's solid, liquid, gas, temperature, electricity or electromagnetism, gravity, and the weak and strong nuclear forces. Now, <laughs> being able to manipulate the weak or strong nuclear forces, whew, that's, a, that's a tricky one to try and figure out, and how would it affect? You could create radiation <laughs> in waves and things like that, break down matter or atomic structures, That's that can cause some very nasty stuff. But those would be the more accurate breakdowns. But I'm not going to focus on the fundamental forces. I want to focus on the states of matter specifically because they're easy to work with. Um, and so as a result, let's work with solid, liquid, gas and temperature. Now, interestingly enough, I mean, if you want to look at what is the most... Um, uh, you know, what is the thing in the natural world that represents solid matter more predominantly? Well, yeah, you would say it's Earth, wouldn't you? Uh, what's the thing in nature that represents liquids more predominantly? Water, gas, air. So, so in that sense, you could use these definitions not as the strict categories, like as I was saying, but the names of the actual states of matter. And so if someone could bend liquid, they could then bend anything that's liquid, not just water, but anything that's liquid. And that causes some interesting effects, because now I want to explore how bending would really work if it conformed to more accurate categories that reflected the laws of physics and the natural world properly. Now, the first thing that we would need to decide is if we're going to take that same liberty that is used in classic bending, which is, as I mentioned before, category-specific telekinesis. And that could work if you could actually te telekinetically manipulate different states. Uh, and so if you were essentially a water bender, you could manipulate water telekinetically and then solids. But this is interesting because in water bending, in the TV show, it can specifically bend ice. It wouldn't be able to do that with this new category system. It would not be able to bend solids. And so ice would actually be something that people who could classically bend earth would be able to bend instead. They would bend ice or anything that is solid. But if the new type of water bending could actually bend any type of liquid, that would include blood. Ooh, which I actually think I already do in Avatar Spender. I haven't seen the whole series. Uh, confession, okay? I've watched about the first third and have enjoyed it. Aha! Uh -huh, I was right. Yes, uh, waterbenders can bend blood um, uh, because of, it makes sense, okay? Which is interesting because, yes, I mean, blood has a large component of water, but uh, it's, of course, red blood cells. But there are other liquids that technically you would be able to bend with the new system that are not traditionally considered. For instance, molten metals. It's a liquid, okay? That, you, like, that would be nasty if you could actually, you know, pick up blazing hot molten metals and throw them at someone. Yes, yes. Now, as I already mentioned, the new type of earth bending, which is solid bending, essentially, they would be the ones who could bend ice and any other solid material, which should also include things like bone. Oh, could you just imagine, like, a, a solid bender just seeing someone and just 
and the someone's entire skeleton just compresses. Ooh, that would like so there are nasty applications of this magic, right? Which is interesting because in Avatar: the Last Airbender, they did obviously figure out a nasty application of water bending, which was blood bending. But there would be other nasty applications of the other bending arts as well that might be forbidden for how evil they are. Bone bending, can you imagine that, right? Now, when we come to air bending, well, it's interesting. Not much would actually change from the way it's used in Avatar: The Last Airbender. But it also depends as to how inventive they can be with what the magic system can do. We see Aang creating kind of small little contained whirlwinds that actually well, he sits on, okay? And that would definitely affect the air pressure in that self-contained bit of air. And so air bending can affect air pressure. Now, if an airbender just wanted to knock someone out, they could just bend the air around someone to make it incredibly thin. Just uh, the air pressure suddenly becomes so bad that a person can barely breathe and they just go unconscious. Just like that. All right. Uh, so also, what about bending the air in someone's lungs? OK, making them explode. There are there are nasty things you can do. But there is another very significant difference with uh, making it gas bending instead of air bending because there is another prominent element that technically air bending would be able to control yeah it's fire fire is a gas okay remember smoke it's just really really hot smoke it's a gas air bending would be able to control fire and so where does fire bending come in okay because fire bending would be classified under air bending but remember there's that other last one temperature bending now you could separate the temperature bending to heating things up and cooling things down and so you'd have like ice but see ice is a solid and so to make this a more rounded and you know effective bending thing i would actually say temperature bending should be able to increase temperature and lower temperature now Interesting. Perhaps you could actually add another concept with bending is that if something is particularly hot or particularly cold, regardless of its state, if it's a solid, liquid or gas, a temperature bender could control it te telekinetically as well, which means they could manipulate the fire. But that means air bending could maybe oppose it. But then again, depending on the rules you establish, you could make it that if one of these elements solid liquid or gas becomes too hot or too cold the solid bender gas bender or liquid bender they lose the ability to control them tele telekinetically but then the temperature bender gains control of them so the temperature bender could actually bend ice and uh, the solid bender couldn't and they could also bend fire or even molten metals perhaps and so that's just an interesting categorization or rule system that you can incorporate into the magic and what's interesting we're not i mean they are changing up okay so you could actually separate temperature in this sense between cold and hot so you could have cold bending and heat bending with the same idea that i had before that when something gets too hot suddenly a heat bender can control but then of course it makes absolute sense that a temperature bender or a heat bender as opposed to a cold bender can increase the temperature of any object or even person sitting at a flame and as soon as it gets hot enough then they can start to manipulate it and control it and that could work really well and that of course would be opposed by say a cold bender which can lower the temperature of anything and as soon as it gets cold enough then they can control it now interestingly again they could kill anyone instantly just by raising their temperature too high or lowering it too low. Persons, people are very fragile human bodies. I mean, we're, it's funny, we're sturdy and strong enough to survive normal things, normal, you know, challenges and problems in the natural world. But we need a very specific, fine-tuned environment to exist in, okay? And as soon as you change up one of those things, whether the, the strength of our own skeleton, the amount of liquid we have in our bodies, the air pressure around us, the temperature, how hot our bodies are or cold our bodies are, we're dead. And so each one of these bending categories has a very potent way of just ending anyone with very little effort.
And so if I was working this magic system, I would actually have it that uh, Bender, just by the natural telekinetic power that they have, has the ability to resist external bending on their own body because they're like the bending is an external telekinetic force they're pushing out and even though they can only manipulate certain specific states you could say it's the same type of telekinetic energy and therefore can actually interact with the same type of telekinetic energy that's tuned into a different state of matter so a solid bender can actually resist heat bending or something like that and that would then enable the benders at least to protect themselves and perhaps even try and protect others from these insta-kill moves that you could technically do if you could just heat up someone's body just like that overheat dead okay uh, skeleton crushed so this is at least one interesting way how bending could more accurately or effectively work in the real world if it was constrained to real world physics and states of matter and i think it works really well it's interesting and the things we talked about right specifically this more accurate categorization system that can work really effectively to any type of magic system that you want to work around the essentially the elements the states of nature okay so instead of doing earth fire wind and water which are actually a combination of multiple different elements all right do that do it this way okay solid liquid gas temperature and you could still call it earth, fire, wind, and water as the, uh, because these are the elements that more largely represent these states. You could call them that. But in the actual operation of uh, these elements, okay, have them confined to these accurate states very strictly when it's actually being used, okay? So you can call it the uh, classic names, but then have it operate very differently. So the fire one would specifically represent heat okay and then you'd probably have solid liquid gas heat and cold five states of matter specifically and uh, and there you go that, that that does it really well and in fact i encourage anyone to use it like it's funny when i propose these new ideas in kind of fantasy rearmed people sometimes reach out to me hey i really like the idea i would like to use it in my role-playing game or book i'm writing um you don't need to ask me permission okay anything that i propose in fantasy rearmed stuff like that unless i say otherwise all right i'm not copywriting or anything like that i encourage people to use because i love you know thinking about new even better dare i say ways of uh, looking at fantasy, all right? Because this way is honestly more realistic. It conforms more accurately to the world and could pro probably, if, if bending could exist in the real world, it would have to be conformed to something like this because these are, this is what the states that the real world is in, okay? And if you were controlling specific elements, you wouldn't be able to control fire. You can control, say, carbon by itself or oxygen by itself, if it was just strict elemental control, but maybe you could mix that, because that is another interesting magic system. What if you had an elemental system that was strictly elemental, but you had to spit pick a specific element from the periodic table, and maybe you could mix it up and say maybe more than one. Maybe like a person could bend or control three elements, gold, well, that'd be interesting. It's not, it's not very common. So you'd want to work with the more common elements like carbon, it's funny, I was going to say oxygen, but oxygen is only 20% of the you know, air we breathe. Controlling nitrogen would actually give you more manipulation of the air around you. <laughs> but controlling oxygen, actually, like if you could control in a way to force oxygen to more readily bond with the things it wants to bond with, like carbon, you create fire just like that through controlling oxygen because it's the combination of oxygen with carbon through a chain reaction, as I mentioned before. So, and what I also love, when you think about this, right, when you really break it down and uh, you find these interesting, unique and original different ideas that uh, will freshen up your fantasy and things like that. And that's why I wanted to look at Avatar The Last Airbender as a uh, point of reference to a broader kind of look at elemental magic. And I found it really interesting and fun. I hope you have as well. I do thank you for watching. I hope to see you in the next video. And until then, farewell.